Welcome to this edition of Supply Chain Spotlight. I'm JT Angstrom with Freight Waves here, joined by a special guest, Adrian Bailey, partner at Oliver Wyman. Adrian, it's a pleasure to have you joining us. Thank you, JT. Great to see you. Great to be here. Now you're joining us uh, from, from Denver, which is your relatively new home. Just moved here. Moved during the pandemic in April from Jacksonville, Florida, where my husband and I had been for many, many years. I do not recommend moving in a pandemic, but we got it all done somehow. Perhaps a little bit more centralized, well, clearly more centralized, which would make uh, the typical consultant travel lifestyle easier, but you're now in a period where no one's really traveling, which is kind now, of Now, yeah, can't travel. But it is beautiful here. It, it, we are very, very lucky to live in such a, a lovely spot. That's great to hear. And so now you've been at OW, Oliver Wyman, for one or two years now, but it's been a full round trip since kind of the beginning of your career. It feels like two years, JT, but it was September of 2019 at Expo at the intermodal uh, conference that I stepped back into Oliver Wyman. After more years than I will say out loud on this call, but straight out of college, I joined the predecessor company, Temple Barker and Sloan, in the transportation practice um, and just sort of learned at, like a sponge from a bunch of practitioners, great guys, uh, some of whom are still with us in the industry at Oliver Wyman, Bill Renicky, one of them, um, who really knew the industry, trucking, rail, um, logistics. And that's where I started. And I've kind of come around full circle. And now you've had a handful of operating roles between kind of both book and uh, consultant experiences, uh, some, one at CSX, another at USIN. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the difference in the learnings that you would have in consulting versus the operate versus in the operating world and how kind of owning a p and is a little bit different than helping someone engineer or enhance one? So I, I actually jumped into the Southern Pacific Railroad as the VP of service planning when I was 28 years old. Um, and we're, we were building for Southern Pacific a service design department that was benchmarked up against the big, the other big railroads. They had never really had that function kind of consolidated within the railroad. Um, and I left there and went to CSX to do a lot of the same thing in the service design operations area. And, um, you know, you, you think railroading is complicated until you get into intermodal. And so the next 10 years was at Pacer in a variety of operating equipment and commercial roles. And then use and like you said, and then back to consulting. Um, you know, when you're consulting, you can bring a lot of outside expertise to the table. You can widen the lens for a company and help them understand how other folks are doing things that, you know, may have some leverage for them. Um, and obviously you bring a, an, a cadre of incredibly talented folks who can um, really accelerate tough problem solving and, and implementations by augmenting the internal team. But you're never really in charge of anything. And so my whole time that I spent in line organizations, the, the great joy and challenge was to have a team of folks actually accomplishing things. Um, and the, the, the most fun was when we were doing things that people were saying, that's not really possible, that's not really feasible, can't make that happen, and, and the light bulb goes off and suddenly, you know, the team is doing it. And once that happens, then they realize there's a whole bunch of more things they can do that everybody's been naysaying about for years. And uh, it's kind of a flywheel to see that energy grow in an organization. Yeah, that's tremendous. And so you spent, as you just mentioned, a, you know, a decade at Pacer, focused on intermodal, and then also had a lot of intermodal exposure at use and intermodal broadly speaking, uh, both as it pertains to truck and as it pertains to rail, uh, largely on the back of the fact that the US is and has increasingly become a more significant consumer economy, has been a much more significant focal point of either an alternative to truck or an expansionary opportunity for the railroad space. And there have been some challenges in either converting freight um, relative to truck or for the rails, actually expanding intermodal profitably in relation to some of the carload ORs that they've benefited from in the past. Can you talk to us a little bit how you think about the secular trends for intermodal growth, the requirements on behalf of the rails to be able to do that within their target, either return on invested capital or return on assets, and 
how to think about that transition to be able to continue to grow sustainably and profitably? So I think the, the fundamental premise within PSR that has always been there, whether you call it PSR or you call it something else, is that the velocity and the reliability of a network operation um, is intrinsically wound up with the financial returns that that operation can deliver. So the faster we could get velocity on the railroad, the lower the overall cost to serve um, was and is in, in these kinds of railroad operations. And I think the most recent trends that um, the railroads have really pursued have, have really unlocked the secret of that equation, which for many, many years, when I first joined the railroad industry, the secret to cost cut savings was cutting trains and cutting crews and consolidating things, which completely disrupts reliability and slows velocity. And so it was the exact opposite of, you know, this opportunity to generate um, a lot of savings. Well, when you're running fast and you're running reliably, your service is also at its highest level. So there are these really wonderful um, positive reinforcements that can happen inside of a railroad that adopts those kinds of operating parameters. That being said, John, you know, intermodal is the growth engine for the railroads in the future. And I think they're very fully aware of the fact that intermodal is a direct competitive product with truck. It's almost, you know, perfectly substitutable this, with the one exception that you're probably going to be a little bit slower on the rail and there's still some challenges in terms of reliability. Those are things that can be solved, um, but it takes a lot of very motivated and dedicated headset around addressing and attacking that problem specifically. And I think we're at this moment of inflection here where, you know, the rewards of PSR have been fairly well mined and we need to get into a growth mentality and taking trucks off the road and growing market share with intermodal is good for the railroads. It's good for the shippers. It's good for the economy. It's good for society. It's got all sorts of benefits, but there are some big changes that the railroads will have to pursue if they're going to maximize the amount of freight that they can attract. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and it would be good for the domestic infrastructure as well to be able to take some truck off the road or at least, at least reduce truck as a function of total passenger car. In the midst of this crisis, right, tax revenues are, you know, we're struggling. We're struggling all the way around and infrastructure is paid for with tax dollars. And yet the railroads have been very, very effective at trimming and tuning their operation to the demand that's, that has been in front of them. Now, their next challenge is we're, we're looking at a surge happening as we speak and how they can bounce back in the other direction will be a, a, a real challenge and, a, and an opportunity. Um, but certainly during the time where the volume has fallen off, they've done a great job of keeping their costs in line and controlling that. And all of that capability allows them to maintain and pay for 100% of the infrastructure that they use to move freight around. And as you say, the more we put on the rail, the less we have to pay out of our own pockets and the less time we have to sit in traffic um, as we all try to navigate across this aging highway system. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Not, not only do the rails deploy their own CapEx to expand their networks, but they're actually tax paying entities. Um, so conceptually, instead of taxpayers paying for it in, in, in one lens, you could argue that they get paid for it. Um, now, you, you talked about some required enablers uh, to be able to continuously grow intermodal sustainably and, and with service in mind as well. You mentioned PSR, uh, which is known for a lot of things, one of which infrastructure-wise is taking out as many hump yards as possible. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the infrastructure changes as a result of PSR, but then also talk about some infrastructure opportunities as it pertains to perhaps, let's say, double, st double stack intermodal on the East Coast, which is, has been challenged due to the uh, older infrastructure, largely in the Northeast, you know, with tunneling and, and uh, overpass highways and things of the sort. Can you talk to us a little bit how you think about the raw infrastructure element as a function of these dynamics? I, I don't know if I'm going to be the perfect person to opine on that physical infrastructure question. I think the railroads have spent a very large amount of CapEx in the last, you know, five to 10 years 
uh, especially in the east, expanding lanes, expanding network opportunity for intermodal. Um, I'm not convinced that the market share on the existing infrastructure is yet where it could be, where it should be. And so I think there's quite a bit of thinking to be done about, you know, how much of the issue is, you know, we need to have more infrastructure, we need to double stack more tunnels, et cetera, et cetera, then what are the other ancillary attributes of rail that need to be um, bolstered against what you get when you buy a truck in order for more folks to continue to make the choice of intermodal over truck? I think it goes well beyond the price point. Um, I think there's there's secular trends that are, frankly, a little disturbing in terms of how customers are looking at their options for, you know, mode choice and mode availability. I'm not sure that um, we've positioned rail in the minds of, you know, the future pro supply chain leaders as something that they need pr to preserve as an option in their network. You alluded to one really important element in there, and you directly brought up another, you know, the, the first being service, the second being pricing, both of which I'd, I'd like to kind of do a dive on. The current state of rail, you know, rail intermodal service in relation to truck and how the rails can think about potentially enhancing that service to be more comparable to truck um, and, and things or levers they may have to, uh, if not directly, uh, uh, change those service metrics, perhaps counter compensate for it by either target freight selection or uh, structuring of specific contracts, things of the sort? We need to think about intermodal as, you know, as a direct substitute to truck. And if you look at the data and the experience that people have with the door-to-door -door intermodal providers, because in large part, if not in every part, the railroads are not the direct delivery service, the pickup and delivery service to the shipper. Right. There's there's somebody else in the middle of that equation. And those operators have done a phenomenal job of getting the on time performance in the eyes of the shipper at a level that's very, very close to truck. But what they are forced to do is they're forced to build buffer into that delivery cycle in order to accommodate the lack of, you know, uh, I'll say the, the high variability of the train arrivals and the actual availability of the freight on a good order chassis. So they're hedging, they're hedging, and all of that hedging adds transit time to the end-to-end -end delivery. It also adds cost to the overall system, which we'll come back around and get into that conversation around the opportunity with price. Um, even over and above all of that, John, is this whole aspect of the, the, the customer experience with a rail product. And we could talk about this with carload as well as intermodal. But when you engage with the trucking community, you're going to get a lot of things that, frankly, are not as available or consistent when you're dealing with a railroad. So you get one entity that controls the move end to end. You get shipment visibility at a level that exceeds what we are currently able to produce in this um, multi-party system that, that drives intermodal for a variety of reasons. Um, you get much more engaged, proactive kinds of interaction, especially when there's a problem or a disruption, and you get a lot more flexibility. So if I needed to take a truck mid-journey and turn it to a different distribution center because for some reason COVID just shut this market down and I can use that product over here, that, that's an email or a phone call, whereas trying to engage in that in the middle of a rail move is, is going to be a much more difficult kind of uh, endeavor. So these are all aspects of the holistic customer experience that requires shippers to have people who are very expert at dealing with the rail and the rail situations. And frankly, I see a lot of pressure um, in, in the in current environment for companies and supply chain organizations to be kind of pulling back away and saying, like, I don't have the bandwidth to figure all that stuff out. All that stuff can be figured out for them, but we have to create a, an environment that makes that easy and interactive and digital and 
you know, create a more truck-like experience outside of transit time and price. These are all the other things that uh, combine to kind of holistically inform when and where I'm going to decide to use rail. Yeah, there's a lot of great points in there, and I think you did a phenomenal job of parsing out sort of the difference between transit time and actual service metrics, which I think is an important nuance. There's a lot of shippers, there's a lot of times when shippers would be okay with perhaps an extended transit time so long as they had confidence in the actual arrival time so they could do inventory planning and supply chain planning. And I think, I think that's a very important nuance that you point out there. Think about one more thing. Think about the time, the energy, the money that has gone into uh, positive train control. Think about the technological uh, demands and complexity that positive train control presented to the railroads. Now, you could argue that you know it was mandated upon them and they had to do it and that distracted them from other things, but they have the capability to solve really hard, complicated problems. And if one of those problems is how do I get the variability on my intermodal train arrivals to go from this to this, what's that going to take? And, and some of them are very actively working on that. That could let you take an entire day out of transit time for your intermodal product because your door provider would be able to know with much higher certainty that the train, the box would be available at that time. And I guess interrelated to that is, is drayage. So what happens when it does arrive? Is there drayage capacity available? Uh, are, there, are, there, are there available assets? What, what's, the, what's the detention at the terminal facility that does the transloading? How significant uh, of, a, of an issue or, or a challenge has drayage been in the space and how much visibility, knowing that a lot of these assets are short haul, some of them are ELD exempt. As a result, there's a lot less data around them. How do you think about effectively, you know, trying to navigate those relatively complex waters? My personal view is that it's a headset change that has to happen, that we have to stop looking at the intermodal stakeholders as arm's length uh, transactors that I need to control with you know, transfer pricing mechanisms and, you know, rules and, you know, circulars and, and start to think about, well, if I was one company, how would I, how would this operation work? How much uh, integration would there be? How much uh, forward looking uh, planning capability would there be? So today, a drage provider very rarely will schedule a driver until the box is actually physically uh, notified as on wheels and available in the rail facility. So I've already lost a whole day, right? Because I'm going to see that activity. I'll schedule that delivery for tomorrow at the earliest. And if we were holistically integrated and we had high certainty that we knew 24 hours out that the box really would be available at that time, I would go ahead and make the bet and schedule the DRE provider for that action. But today, I have no incentive to do that because more often than not, I'll be wrong and nobody's going to pick up the cost of the dry run when, when, it, when it does inevitably happen. Now, if you're an integrated operator and you own your own trucks and boxes and chassis and you have a very tight integration with the railroad, you can solve some of that on your own. But if the variability of the train arrival and the box availability is still very wide, you're still not going to take that bet. No, absolutely. I think that's a critical link that I think is frequently overlooked. So the, the other bucket we, disc we talked about bringing up was pricing. Let's talk about pricing a little bit. Now, pricing, pricing on intermodal is a lot different than pricing on truck, um, despite the fact that they could be considered uh, competitive modes. Um, from an outsider's view or from an analyst's view, you, one might categorize intermodal pricing as uh, or pricing on behalf of intermodal companies, whether it's the rails or IMCs, as relatively more price disciplined um, with a uh, uh, significantly less spot exposure than you would see on you know, traditional OTR uh, on the trucks. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how the rails think about, um, either do or don't think about pricing the market, whether it's purely a cost plus equation, whether they think about pricing in relation to the alternative opportunities, whether it be truck or otherwise, perhaps maritime in some instances. And then how they how thoughtful they are around, you know, when do we think about taking rate increases or alternatively, if volumes are fleeting, do we think about being 
uh, aggressive on price to protect volume or otherwise maintain discipline and wait for volume to come back. So I'll give you the perspective of someone who purchased from the railroads as an intermediary in two different companies, once at Pacer, once at Eusen. Um, and, and my experience with the intermodal groups, I think they're very thoughtful, John. And I think there's times when they are looking at internal landscapes and they're making decisions about something that as the third party provider, when I see the result of that, it might look very confusing to me. Um, and I might not exactly understand why in this particular arena, they're not willing to get more aggressive and go after something. So one example might be in a, in a box shortage situation, there are certain lanes that for the railroad, those boxes are much, much more productive assets than perhaps the lane that I'm bringing to them with my opportunity. And therefore, uh, the, the price point will be very challenging and it won't make any sense. It's like, we'll never win this business at this price because of where the trucks are. And you know what? The railroads may be just exactly okay with that. So they, they do understand their network dynamics. They do understand, you know, how the equipment flows and moves has a huge uh, um, effect upon what their ultimate end economics are going to be. Now, that being said, I think the absence of the true spot kind of market mentality and the fact that there's this sort of, this is Adrian's opinion, and it's not true for every intermodal rail marketer out there, but a lot of the disciplines grew up out of the carload framework, right? There weren't intermodal shipments when all of the pricing and the costing thinking, which is quite deep and complex at these railroads, came into being. So when intermodal sprang up and started to sprout, of course, they took their best practices and brought it across. That doesn't always serve them in the world of a truck competitive market because the trucks um, move price up and down way, way more agile, more frequently, uh, with a lot less time. Uh, and so sometimes the railroads will be caught behind the curve when the rates are going up, and they'll be caught behind the curve when the rates are going down. And if if and as, and I believe they will solve it, they solve that, their, their overall total margin generation will increase, right? Because they'll hold on to the volume longer. And in many cases, they'll end up with more margin than they would have when they were riding behind the curve of the trucks. So I think there's a lot of spot freight that's kind of not ever addressed within the intermodal market. And, and certainly in today's world with the tender rejections at 25%, you know, there's a lot of freight looking for a home and, you know, there's a lot of upward pressure on the price. And so to the extent that railroads can take that capacity and play that game smartly with their third-party intermediaries together, um, everybody wins. Can you talk to us a bit about what models you see working well through which types of cycles and where you see best practices and alternatively where you see perhaps the most significant opportunities that are either really structurally built in and being utilized effectively or perhaps an opportunity for the next evolution of growth? For the last 10, 15 years, the private, on the domestic side, the private box operators have been taking share from the wholesale fleets of which now you really just have the railroad fleets plus uh, the, the COPSI option that Gary Old has um, with some containers, some 53 foot containers uh, in the BN network. Um, but the lion's share of the, the container capacity is with the private private uh, intermodal operators. And that share shift has been fairly consistent and ongoing. Um, I don't know, John, where the end of the road, you know, what does the picture look like? Um, but I think it, it's an incredibly important strategic uh, element that the railroads are going to have to figure out uh, for those of for those of them that still have their own rail containers that they're offering through the third party network. And when we were at USIN, uh, we would look at scorecards and our service delivery to the end customers. And these were very, very large uh, intermodal shippers. Our service delivery was as good or better than the private box operators. 
So you can hire an IMC and your service, a third party intermodal provider who's using a rail box, your service in terms of transit and on-time delivery and pickups and data exchange, et cetera, is, is as good or better than the private box offer. So there's no difference there. The difference is whether or not you can get the integration in the model so that the cost to serve can come down far enough for those players to be competitive in the market. Because what you see out of the private box operators is this heavy, heavy focus on the spin in the network and the removing of the empty miles and the container wait times and the number of times they go to the ground and pick the box back up again because you know they, could, they couldn't keep the box flowing through some sort of a downturn cycle. Very expensive when that happens. So what I see is that in the rail box network, they tend to, to have more of that. They have to absorb more of that flex up and down within that rail box fleet because the private box operator's headset is so focused on not allowing those things to happen and maximizing the freight that they have and that they pull into their network very purposefully. A lot harder to do when you're when you're working with multiple intermediaries that are um, sharing a pooled fleet like the railroads. But um, the rail box fleet is still, you know, almost as large as the largest private box fleet. And it's a substantial portion of the capacity that's in the network, um, which, which kind of brings up another point that I think is interesting that shippers, shippers, know who they're dealing with in terms of who the door-to-door -door provider is, but oftentimes don't know what the underlying rail carrier is. And so sometimes they can find themselves with 100% of the freight on one Western carrier or one Eastern carrier. And in the event that there is some sort of an event that happens that disrupts that particular carrier, um, they've missed the opportunity to have that diversified service offering and keep themselves fluid on, on the other provider. Um, but it's not something that is top of mind. And, and this kind of goes back to what we started with, which is, do the railroads really help shippers and make it easy for them to understand how to use this incredibly uh, huge, beneficial rail network that we have here in North America, better than any part else in the world? But it, it's almost like you have to kind of be, you have to have been given the secret decoder ring and you have to be part of the, the, the Yoda of Ye rail so that you understand exactly how you need to kind of maneuver to take advantage of this. So with that, Adrian, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate all of the perspectives you'd provided, not just here on this discussion, but also in the past. And same goes for, for you and your, your team. Please tell them all I said hello. Uh, I know many of them very well. Um, I've traveled with many of them. And so uh, uh, several of them have been mentors in the past and I greatly appreciate that. And so thank you for your time. I hope you really enjoy Denver. And uh, I hope the duration of your, your year is wildly successful from a client uh, service perspective, which I know it will be. And so again, thank you very much for joining Adrian Bailey, partner at Oliver Wyman. I'm JT Anction with Freight Waves. Have a great day.